welcome to the Redeeming Truth Podcast. My name is John. I'm one of the pastors at Redeemer Bible Church, and I'm here with my friend and uh, colleague, David Farnell. We are doing a mini-series called Touchy Subjects, a podcast that might make you mad, because we're, we're hitting on some issues within evangelicalism that is really not popular to talk about and really not popular to uh, critique, to interact with, but that's what we're doing, and we're doing it because we think that if we're not careful, we can undermine the Word of God in the, the preachers and the teachers of God's Word, which then moves into the congregation and undermines people's view there. And so, Dave, last time we talked, we talked about um, the Bible, we talked about historical critical ideologies, we talked about some of the ways that people interpret the Scriptures in a way that's, 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 that's contradictory to, to a, a, a classical understanding of inerrancy, infallibility, inspiration. And so can you kind of summarize where we were last time? Sure. I uh, want to put forth something that's very important, a little axiom that is so very true. Those who do not remember the lessons of history are doomed to repeat errors of the past. Mm -hmm. So what we've been talking about is something that is not new. Mm -hmm. The early church all the way through, God's people may not have been a majority, but God's people held to the inerrancy of Scripture. They may not have used that term. There have been terms used. Mm -hmm. We could trace it through church history. They believed that God's Word was inspired, and because God cannot lie... Mm -hmm that God's word cannot lie, and therefore it was inerrant. Uh, but we've seen cycles in history where in academia, and it usually starts in academia, where inerrancy was undermined. And we traced last time where at the turn of the 20th century, because of where they were sending all of their professors to be in the pulpits of churches, these professors were going to uh, very radical liberal institutions, first in Germany, and then uh, in Britain. Uh, D. Lloyd-Jones said he would not study theology in Britain because he knew how bad shape they were mm -hmm. in, but that doesn't matter with the evangelicals. No. The more prestigious the degree, the more they want to study there. Uh, but remember now, you are a product of your teaching in many ways. Mm -hmm. So they bring back radical things. And at the turn of the 20th century, the church was using the word infallibility, which is the same word as inerrancy. There shouldn't have been, but what they right. meant was the Bible is infallible even if it contains errors. Hmm. So the church started using the word inerrancy because infallibility had lost its meaning. It should be synonymous, yeah. but play games is what the academics do. This is battle stations, sound the alarm. Evangelicals, your seminaries are in grave difficulty because of where they have sent their men to be trained. So we started using the word inerrancy, uh, but once again, in the 60s and 70s, they began to say, well, the Bible is inerrant, I believe inerrancy, but there are some, uh, these ancients weren't able to report things as accurately, and so therefore there are, well, they don't want to call them errors, but they are inaccuracies there, and so now the word inerrancy has lost its meaning among many evangelicals. The place where God's word is safe is in the pew. But if we keep training our ministers to inhabit pulpits where liberal critical scholars and evangelical critical scholars are influencing the minds of our preachers, we will destroy the empowerment that a preacher has to preach forth boldly God's word because they will be undermined in their thinking. And so today, we'd like to look at the uh, idea that not only is inerrancy so important, but wedded intimately to inerrancy is your methodology hmm. of interpretation. Now, I'd like everybody, if you want, 
you can go to isca-apologetics.org and you can download this nice little commentary on explaining biblical inerrancy. This will give you a much more thorough than we can do in a podcast, and it's available free. ISCA Apologetics was started by men who firmly believe in the inerrancy of Scripture in its traditional sense. This was done by John Sproul. Many of you know him. Uh, He passed away, and by uh, Norman Geisler. I affectionately refer to Norman as Storm and Norman because he was a battleship that sure upset evangelical critical scholars when I was in school because uh, he was uh, very skilled at showing the illogic of some things. And this goes through and will show people the intimate relationship between your trust in God's Word and your method of interpretation. And so iscaapologetics.org, and then Explaining Biblical Inerrancy. You download that, you'll have a great understanding. So, in the history of the church, the, uh, the early church interpreted God's Word plainly normally. And the term for plainly normally that we use today because of the Reformation in 1517 is grammatico-historical, or grammatico-historical literal. So what does this mean? Well, before we go there, Dave, yeah. can I ask you, the, why is there, what is the connection between inerrancy and, and interpretation? What, what, is it that, that, what, what is it that we need to understand about that connection? One shows trust in God's Word and allows mm-hmm. God's Word to judge us. Mm-hmm. The other one we're about to talk about, historical-critical, shows distrust in God's Word, and you become the judge of God's Word. Now, why is Mm -hmm. that? Can I do an illustration with you? Sure. Put your hand out like this. What if I took this knife and I Mm -hmm. cut across here? Mm -hmm. What would you think about that? You would try desperately to avoid me doing that, right? Absolutely. You have a violent person here with it. (laughs) Um, Look, the Word of God is sharp, like a two-edged sword, Hebrews says. Yes. And I think I'm going to... What did I do with my glasses here. What did I, oh, here they are. Uh, and it says here, the Word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing as far the division of soul and spirit, of joint and marrow, and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Well, that means that not only can the Word of God encourage us, but it also can do its operative work to sanctify us. Mm-hmm. That means that there are un- things that will convict us. Some want to avoid that conviction. Sometimes the word offends critical evangelical scholars. So they are motivated to develop a method of interpretation where if there is an offensive part of God's word, they can avoid it. You ever play with Mm -hmm. Plato? Mm -hmm. Plato is a blob, but you can make Plato into different things. That's the difference between grammatico-historical and we'll talk about historical-critical. Grammatico-historical allows the Word of God in its plain normal sense to say plainly normally what God's Word means. It allows for figures of speech, yes, but it says, I do not explain away a passage by taking and saying, well, uh, this passage, this book shouldn't be treated literally prior to my examination of it, I allow the Word of God to do its work. A historical critical by liberal critical scholars and evangelical critics, they judge the Word because parts of it offend them, and so therefore they like the Plato, the magic of Plato, and they can mold God's Word into something that is more palatable to them, the form they like. That's essentially what's going on. So when somebody believes the Bible is the Word of God, They believe in inspiration, a classical view of inspiration, that the words of the Bible came from God himself through human authors, um, that he is the ultimate source of scripture. Then what you're going to do then is you're going to use methods of interpretation that allow that word to speak, that that you're you're not going to try to obscure it because you want to know what it means because you believe it's God's word. A, somebody who doesn't believe it's God's word, 
is going to use methods of interpretation to avoid, like you said, to avoid the meaning of the text, the plain, obvious meaning of the text. You're going to use that, that ideology to obscure the meaning of the text, to avoid what that text says about a person's life. They become offended in some way with portions of Scripture. Many of these evangelical critical scholars, along with their liberal uh, counterparts, let's take Genesis. Well, they go there in the plain, normal sense, grammatico historical literal was god spoke things into being he did it in 24 hour cycles and he created a woman from a man's rib that that offends them they say oh come on we're moderns and that can't possibly be so it's poetic historical as we talk mm -hmm. it offends them why they were probably my guess would be that they probably were influenced by evolutionary hypothesis. Today, hey, evolution is so yesterday, John. Today, yeah. it's panspermia and That's the right. aliens put us here. Yeah. They better catch up with the program because <laughs> evolution is so yesterday, and they're still wanting to conform the word to modern scientism, so it offends them. So what do they do? They, they take historical critical, and they're going to mold it and make it. And so all of a sudden, just like we had in church history, we need to understand this more figuratively than literally. Mm -hmm. And there's where they try to remove the offense. So what's happening today then is we've got men who would affirm a classical view of inspiration, a classical view of inerrancy. At least they would sign that statement. Oh, yeah. But they're using the methodology of men, uh, of scholars who did not believe in that classical view of inspiration. Exactly. What's happening here is I call historical critical an ideology. Let me explain mm -hmm. why. Grammatico historical comes with childlike faith in Scripture. It says, I know God cannot lie, and I'm going to trust my Father that He's telling me what He did, how He acted in history. The others, historical critical scholars, aren't at that area, they basically, when they come across a section, they will say, well, that doesn't make sense to me. I'm going to have to use historical critical Plato ideology magic, make it more compatible to me. One is allowing the Word of God to do its work, mm -hmm. grammatical. The others are playing games with Scripture so that they avoid some type of offense that that part mm -hmm. of Scripture is causing them. This mm -hmm. is, and then they put it into academia and make it look real good. It's kind of like a pig with lipstick. Historical critical ideology is this pig where you put jewelry and lipstick on it and it looks real good. It's, it's still, still a pig. pig. Well, we want to slaughter that pig right now. <laughs> I brought and, the knife uh, to do it. Yeah, you did. You brought the <laughs> knife, so we're good to go. But but truly, what, what we want to say is that we, we don't want to mix the methods of unbelief with the truth of God's Word. We, 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 want, to, we want the the methods of belief to be dominating the way that we, we interpret the Scriptures. Yeah, but if you've gone to these schools, Ivy League prestigious schools, you begin to believe in your own ability rather than the convicting power of God's Holy mm -hmm. Spirit. And you think, and I've heard them say it in class at Dallas and other places when I was there, you can take the critical ideologies and use them for good. So they think they're smart enough, I guess, and mm -hmm. so brilliant because they went to schools that they can brag about, that they're able to do this. And that would be the first time in history mm -hmm. that anybody's ever been able and they haven't done it, to use something that will destroy God's Word and think they can make it do good. They have never been able to, and I can show you in the proof of what they do, but let's, mm -hmm. if we could, Absolutely. let's talk about grammatico historical. Yeah, so a method of a method of interpreting the Bible that is based on the inspiration and inerrancy of Scripture. It shows trust in God's mm -hmm. Word because you say, Father, I know you wrote your Word to guide me, you do not lie, and I will take it in its plain, normal sense. And there's an old saying that I like, and it, of course, is it's just a saying, but I grew up on this saying, and, and it's a good one. It's David Cooper's old statement, when the plain sense of Scripture makes common sense, seek no other sense. Take every word 
at its primary, ordinary, usual, literal meaning unless the facts of the immediate context, studied in light of related passages, and axiomatic and fundamental truths indicate clearly otherwise. So in other words, you don't go in there saying, I'll judge the word. You go in there saying, I'm going to take it in its plain normal sense, let it judge me. Right. Because look, if you're truly born again, does God's Spirit affirm His word? Or does God's spirit cast doubt? You can always tell if the spirit yeah. is operative in something is, does it glorify Jesus Christ? The Holy Spirit, yeah. it said, Jesus said, he will glorify me. So always measure this against, your, is your interpretive method glorifying Jesus Christ or is it casting doubt to your seminary students, to your congregation on the word of God in its plain ordinary sense? The work of the Spirit will become evident. Genesis chapter 1. There are many evangelical critical scholars. Come on now. They were long day ages and all of this, you know, and evolution, and they want to mix it. What does that indicate? Well, first of all, it indicates that they are casting doubt on God's Word, which to me would tell me the Holy Spirit doesn't do that. Mm -hmm. And it would also show that they think that they are the judge of God's word rather than let the convicting power of God's spirit do it. So what happens, like in the Reformation, you had tradition, you had the popes um, as the, the, the majesty. They're, they're the ones who are going to interpret the scripture for us. Now that, that, that's been pushed aside in the Reformation, but now it's been replaced by the scholars. Yes, but exactly. Here is the really startling thing. Evangelicals have always uh, gotten mad at the Pope for saying, we're going to do it in Latin. We're going to tell you what to believe. Now we've got evangelical critical scholars telling their seminary students, we're going to tell you how you should believe just like the Romanists did. Mm -hmm. They're now the experts. We have gone to the elite universities. We know better than our seminary students, and we're going to show you how you think. This is dangerous, John. Rather than saying, here are the methods of interpretation right. applied, consistently applied well, you will arrive at the meaning of Scripture. Right. So what we have, the early church, like Psalm 2, Psalm 1 and 10 took them very literally with the early church. Though. But then as the church started to interface with Hellenistic society, uh, the Greeks had invented something called allegorization. That means you don't take the literal sense. They didn't deny the literal sense, but it wasn't important. And what you do is you find other allegorical meanings below the text that aren't supported really by the literal sense. And so you know what they could do? As, as Romanism rose by 490, they could make the Bible in its, say whatever it, they wanted for it to support their, uh, their, their pet doctrines that they wanted, even mm -hmm. though the plane didn't say it. So the church went into thousand years of darkness and they had fourfold meaning, and they could make all sorts of doctrines be found that weren't there. Mm -hmm. So uh, the reformers, it was really a revolution in interpreting the Bible, because mm -hmm. hermeneutics means interpreting the Bible. What are your rules of interpretation? Here is what Luther said about, because he was Romanist in his day before he became a believer. He said Luther denounced allegorical approach. Allegories are Empty speculation, as it were, the scum of Holy Scripture. Origins, allegories are nothing, not worth so much dirt. So what, what, was the, what were the Romanists doing? Something offended them in the word, or they needed to support some doctrine that they were writing at the time, and they would use different allegorical senses instead of the literal, and they could yeah. find, you could find anything you, find you anything want. There, surprise, yeah. surprise, Sergeant Carter. <laughs> Well, what, what we want to say is that when it comes to interpreting the scriptures, the bottom line is that we want to interpret it in light of what the text is. And the text is the word of God, which means that, that God is a communicating God, human beings as, as image bearers of God with the ability to communicate. Um, God built into human beings the ability to communicate. So, so grammatical historical interpretation of scripture is just the normal, plain, ordinary way that we interpret anything because it's jesus reminded us that 
the author of scripture is the spirit of truth mm -hmm. and that there is a teaching ministry of the Holy Spirit that a born again, true born again believer has that will guide that believer to understanding. Now, I under know that we don't all agree. There are different denominations sure. and out there who are listening. So how come we don't all agree, Dave, if there is this teaching ministry, 1 John 2, 20 and 21, he's the spirit of truth. Well, first of all, not everybody who's involved in interpreting scripture is a genuine believer. And Paul said, the natural man does not receive the things of God, and he is not able to know. So this is the trouble when you pick up a commentary. Suppose it's a commentary by Boltman. Uh, lots of rewards connected, uh, lots of awards connected to it, a lot of prestige connected to it. But w was did the man who denied most of the New Testament, would God's Spirit be involved in teaching him? Mm -hmm. I doubt it. So you have to understand that the fruits of what we're seeing are intimately connected to is someone truly born again. Then another thing is this, he may be born again or she may be born again, but you know, sin can deceive us. First mm -hmm. John, or for Ephesians 4, 8, there's the darkness, don't walk as the Gentiles walk in the darkness yeah, of their 14, mind. Yep. So that could cause Christians at times to want to misinterpret God's word, even if they don't knowingly know it. Mm. But I don't think that the teaching ministry of the Holy Spirit is going to get down. You ever get into those systematic theology, infralapsary and superlapsary and all of this? I got so confused on all of that stuff. Uh, thank God I'm a New Testament guy and not a theologian. Mm. I don't know if the teaching ministry of the Holy Spirit gets down into all these little cut pieces, but it does give us the centrality of, of God created this world. By the way, didn't Hebrews say that by faith we understand that God mm. created this world? Yeah. So the Holy Spirit will teach those who are born again, who are, uh, who are, how would I say it, who are surrendering to that teaching ministry, and it will assure them of God's word and guide them as they pray to the understanding of God's word. But when the word of God cuts, there are some who become offended and will seek the Plato and go another direction. And you have to watch for these kind of things. So the way to, in, to understand God's word intimately connected to inerrancy is God is the spirit of truth. He cannot lie. So I understand when I read his word that he is the spirit of truth and doesn't play games with his word. So when it comes to these, um, these rules of interpretation, which grammatical historical uh, exegesis seeks to expound, the, the thing about these rules that separates them from historical critical ideology ultimately is that these rules are discovered, they're not invented. Meaning what we're talking about when it comes to these rules, grammatical, historical rules of interpretation, is that this is built into communication. Exactly. The, the, very, wor the, the very way that God created human beings to communicate. Right. Good. This is built into that. That's very good. It seeks to uh, understand God's word in its plain, simple sense. It allows the word of God to convict and to do its work and you're not judging the Word of God like historical right. critical. You're allowing God's Word to judge you. But remember now, uh, the evangelical critical scholars with these prestigious degrees, I think somehow with some of them, don't want to speak hasty generalization, but with a lot of them, they think that they're going to have to judge God's Word. Very dangerous spiritually. So what we're saying here is there, there are no additional authorities that are needed to help interpret the scriptures because the scriptures are the highest authority being God's word. So we, we know what God has said by the faithful and accurate interpretation of the scriptures, not bringing in some prophet, 
some other writings, some traditions, some personal experience or standpoint, that those don't become the authorities that we interpret Scripture through. Scripture is its own authority. It is the highest authority. And that we, we come, we sit, like you said, underneath the Scriptures and ask it, what do you mean, rather than imposing meaning on the text. Right, because... If you impose a meaning on the text, you have an agenda. That's called eisegesis. You read into the Scripture. What you want to do is let Scripture teach you. Yeah, when we do that, we, with, with proper rules of interpretation, we hear the voice of God rather than hearing the voice of men. Well, the, really the only proper rule would be what we would call plain, normal, grammatico. Let me talk about that. Grammatico yeah, historical that. interpretation. That means that we would take the rules of grammar, which mean we'd study the original language, Mm -hmm. uh, and I know that guys in seminary are tortured with Greek and Hebrew, and then we would try to understand that language as best we could, then we would understand history, that God has acted through history, and that he has given us It may not be thorough, I'd like more information, but he's given us what he wants us to know, and it's historical. But today's historical critical evangelicals are postmodernists. We'll talk about this more, Mm -hmm. where they don't believe history is possible. There's a book called Key Events, written by Bach and Webb, in which in the second chapter, they say that all we have in the Gospels are surviving traces of Jesus' life. We have to apply criteria of authenticity to figure out what really happened. Well, they're judging God's Word. Mm -hmm. Uh, What we have there is exactly what Jesus did. It may not cover everything he did. Even John said Mm -hmm. we could fill books filled with this, Mm -hmm. but nonetheless, God guided his Word and everything there plenary, verbally inspired, plenary, complete, verbal, word for word, inspired. It's not just little things in there that we have to determine are surviving traces. That, to me, is absolutely appalling Mm -hmm. that that would be said on the Gospels. So today, what happens when you say that the Gospels have only some surviving traces somewhere, you start what they did. They searched for the historical Jesus. Do you mm-hmm. know that major evangelical seminaries that I could mention are actually have their men involved in searching for the historical Jesus? Now, first mm-hmm. of all, the word historical Jesus is a philosophical term. It means the Jesus that the world would accept, that the critical scholars would accept, but not the one Jesus they will never accept. you know what that is? The, the Jesus of the Bible. Yeah. So getting back to this, this is why I, everybody should get this explaining biblical inerrancy because they knew how intimately your method of interpretation was tied to inerrancy. And this is what they said. We believe in grammatico historical exegesis, rules of grammar, mm-hmm. facts of history, and that God can guarantee, God can't, not human historians, but God can guarantee the accuracy of the history mm-hmm. in the Bible. And this is what they said and gives evangelical critical scholars heartburn, I believe, my Mm -hmm. opinion. We deny the legitimacy of any treatment of the text or quest for sources lying behind it that leads to relativizing, dehistoricizing, or discounting its teaching or rejecting its claims to authorship. Now, Mm -hmm. that's why they want to modify ICBI, ICBI because Mm -hmm. what it's saying here is take, I want anybody to get, if you have a critical uh, commentary on the Gospels. Do you have any here? No, I have them here on my computer. Okay. If you look inside, you'll see that because most of these guys that write these are critical scholars, that they'll spend a half to three-fourths of their commentary on Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, at least Matthew, Luke, uh, searching for sources. Mm -hmm. And there's a reason why when we get into historical critical, they're not they're not explaining the text, they're searching for sources which does nothing to the proclamation of God's word. So ICBI said, we understand inerrancy is intimately tied to childlike, simple trust, Father, the spirit of truth, and I will plainly normally take the rules of grammar, the facts of history, I will look at the context, and I will get into the context. Today, evangelicals are saying we need to apply a 
a position on the style of literature we're dealing with. So let me give you an example. They go to Genesis and they say, well, Genesis 1 through 3, I'm going to, before I ever get there, I think that's allegory. Here we go with what it is. So I'm going to then say by saying, before I get into the text, it's allegory. No. What you do is this. Any portion of scripture, you do not determine the genre until you've examined the context. And grammatical historical looks at the context and it judges that text of understanding on the basis of allowing the Word of God to speak for itself. It doesn't eisegete genre into it or style of literature. It allows the Word of God. It's history in Genesis 1 through 3, whether we like or not, uh, uh, we allow God's Word to speak. Yeah, it's not poetic at all. There's studies that have been done examining all the poetry in the Bible and then comparing it to Genesis and showing there is no correlation. It definitely is literal history. That's how it's presented when you get into the context. And so therefore, the formation of what we understand from the Bible, you get into the context, you take in its plain normal sense, you understand the words in the original, and this helps determine what God is saying. So what we've seen so far is the foundation for historic, grammatical historical exegesis is the inspiration of Scripture. It's the salvation of the interpreter, 1 John 2.20, uh, 1 Corinthians 2.14 being examples of that. Um, third is the purpose of Scripture, which is to save and to sanctify, which means that as the Word of God, it judges us. It judges us as the salvation. It judges us as to our sanctification. And then from there, there are these rules of interpretation built into reality, built, built into human communication that God himself built into, l rules of logic, things of that nature, built into reality. And then we discover those rules as we interact with each other. So like you're saying, we take communication in its normal, plain, literal sense, unless the context says something to us would, we should think something yeah, else. And we would look for hyperbolic speech, Absolutely. something that's obvious, not something that's so subtle yeah. that only evangelical critical scholars can see it. And another thing is, the key is context, context, context. Just like in computers... If you ever had this problem, back up, back up, back up, because <laughs> I've lost some things. You always want to make sure that you're looking at the contextual flow of how the author is writing and understanding the logic as he's putting it forth. And in essence, the grammatical story, simply put, is God means what he says, he says what he means. Mm -hmm. And so some of the rules for grammatical historical is that Scripture interprets Scripture. The totality of Scripture in helps interpret individual texts of Scripture. Uh, all interpretation cannot contradict other parts of Scripture. Why? Because this is the Word of God. Why? Because God cannot lie. He cannot make errors. So there aren't going to be contradictions. So our interpretation of an individual text cannot uh, contradict other parts of Scripture. And then from there, we get meaning from the text. Right, we get meaning out of the text right. rather than Impose importing it. meaning into the text. But remember, grammatical historical is the only control objectively on Scripture. If yes. you go with historical critical, you want the Bible to say what you want it to say. Mm -hmm. There's no control. But if you stick to the plain normal sense, the control is you're letting God's Word speak mm -hmm. and not imposing your own agenda on that. Well, we wouldn't need grammatical historical interpretation of the text in this sense that if we were if we were born in Palestine in the first century, if we had the same interpretive background as the apostles, then we would we would read the text and we, we would have all of this already. We would know the grammar, we would know the history, we would know the context, we would know the figures of speech. The communication of the apostles to people in their day made sense to those people because they're they're living at the same time. They 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 live in the same culture. They have the same understandings. For us, two thousand years later, we need to go back into the original language, which is in our language. We need to go back into the history and the grammar and the culture and the context and the figures of speech and the syntax, we have to go back into all of those things to understand what the text is saying because there's a distance between us, but that distance is also bridged by the same spirit who moved the authors of the text is the same spirit that lives inside this saved interpreter of the text. Right. Remember now, um, it doesn't matter what 
you think the Bible says. Right. It matters what the Bible says. Yes. So in the turn of the century when the church was having trouble, Kierkegaard and others, the existentialists, they were reading meaning into scripture, yes. making it say what they wanted to say. The goal of grammatico historical is, Lord, teach me your word and I will understand it in its plain normal sense, which then presents a control. Mm -hmm. And the reformers, John Chrysostom, were all fighting against uh, elements in the church that wanted to do wild speculation. Anything that disagreed with them, they could do to one of the fourfold meanings to find their way out of that, you know? Yeah, and so this, so what we're not saying is this isn't literalism. So like Ruth 2.12 talks about uh, being the, the, the wings of God coming under the shadow of God's wings. And so that doesn't mean, okay, therefore God has wings. This isn't literalism. This is understanding that the normal use of language includes things like uh, figures, figures of speech yeah. and, and metaphor and yes. things of that nature. But, but all of those figures of speech and metaphors connect to some literal understanding, right? right? Yeah, there can be a wooden headed mm -hmm. literalism that evangelical critical scholars try to bring up as a uh, false thing. We're not saying that, but we're saying plain normal sense. It allows for figures of speech like yeah, that. The, but the it, Bible uses symbols and metaphor and imagery, yes. but the normal literal should be assumed. That's your goal. Unless the normal literal, or un unless it, it makes the literal absurd. That's this your, is the normal right. way that we communicate it with makes each other. Makes common sense. Yes, to seek no, no other, other sense. sense. Absolutely, absolutely. And that glorifies God because what does that do? It says, Father, I know you are the God of truth who wrote so that I could understand what you want me to know. But the others, I wonder what kind of a God they serve when they think that they will judge God's word and that God cannot effectively, honestly, truly plainly normally communicate what kind of a god do they have well, i want to know what their definition of god is anymore well with this understanding of of interpreting the bible it allows us to to evaluate whether or not an interpretation is accurate or not if you don't have these controls then the accuracy or inaccuracy of interpretation then goes to the credentials of the person saying it right but, but this problem of wanting to read into scripture is cyclic in church history. John Chrysostom was fighting the beginnings of it. Yep. A thousand years later, Luther's fighting it. And now with evangelical critical scholars and their uh, applying of historical critical ideology, which in essence, they want to allegorize it. They want to give it a, it's not literal. We have to take this more figuratively. They are now going back into this allegorical, make the Bible say whatever you mean. And I'm going to give examples of it when we get into historical critical. But here, the check is the reformers and those who uh, uh, transformed Europe and spread the gospel, the power of God's word is in its plain, normal sense because it shows the spirit of truth communicates. I mean, you can see this, just like you said, you can see it in the effect. What is the effect of historical critical ideology on the church at large? It's, it's heresy. That's it's, how, leaving, right. it's leaving historic orthodoxy. Why are people getting into CRT? Well, because they've trained guys in, in the wrong areas, not in the plain normal sense. And since it's not supported in the Bible, they have to make it up now. Well, yeah, when you teach that there's no objectivity in interpretation, yes. when you teach that everything is standpoint determined, yes. then of course there's no true interpretation. So you can make the Bible do whatever you, you want. You can make it just like Roman interpreters a thousand years ago yes. were doing, yes. 500 years ago were doing, still do to this day, I just think... like cults have been doing, allegorizing the text, making it say whatever you want. And then what, what do you do? How do you fight against that? Well, the Bible doesn't say that. Well, the Bible says whatever I want it to say. Yeah because it's my standpoint. And so isn't this not, I think, our, when it's Paul said, I am not ashamed of the gospel, is this attempt at explaining away Genesis or Jonah or other places an inherent shame in the word of God? Yeah, it's the whisper of the serpent. Sure, right? It's Have not the Holy Spirit. God the said. Holy Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit will produce the confidence of God's word. But here I think there's a subtle 
oh, I'm embarrassed by Genesis. I wouldn't want to go to a secular university and say, uh, so I'm ashamed and I'm going to do something about it. I'm going to take the Play-Doh and make it into something by eisegeting, by historical critical attempts. Or go ahead and believe it, but just don't voice it. Right. Just don't say anything yeah. to anybody about yeah. it. Keep that to yourself. Yeah. Well, listen, we have more to say about this. And so uh, join us for our next installment of the Redeeming Truth podcast, where we're going to continue talking about grammatical historical exegesis, the importance of that, and then contrast that with historical critical ideology, which is becoming and has become all the rage within evangelicalism. We'll see you next time for Redeeming Truth. Hey, thanks for joining us today. Make sure to subscribe so you don't miss any future content.